would like to welcome on uh, behalf uh, of the Federalist Society sponsors, apologies if I mispronounce any names, uh, uh, Mr. Rutledge Clement, the President-elect of the Louisiana Bar Association. Mr. Clement, so that people know where you are, could you stand up? <laughs> Edward Hillier, the president of the New Orleans Bar Association and the co-sponsor of the con Convention for Continuing Legal Education Purposes. Uh, Joy Clement from the Federal Bar Association of New Orleans, the second largest chapter in Louisiana. And I'm told that in addition to the various judges who were here with us yesterday and welcomed at that time, that Judge Jerry Smith uh, from the Fifth Circuit, uh, U.S. Fifth Circuit, arrived today and is here. Judge Smith, if you could... Unless anyone has failed to, uh, to notice his arrival, uh, Judge Buckley, Senator Buckley, our great friend Jim Buckley is here, and I hope that he's There are really three topics uh, today. Uh, uh, you, you should all consider yourself fortunate because we're not going to do a slideshow on this because it would turn your stomach and ruin your lunches if you had to think about the devastation in Central and Eastern Europe wrought in, the envir in various environmental ways over the last 40 years uh, under the communist rulers of, uh, of uh, the region. Uh, and uh, I am going to constrain myself to suggesting three things. That the first topic is, of course, the question of the nature of the environmental problem, which I know that our speakers will be addressing. Uh, the second question is, I assume that in some instances, commentators will be talking about American or Western response to environmental uh, dilemmas thus far and avoiding previous mistakes, whatever is meant by that. But a third issue that I think will have to be addressed is, again, the legal context within which environmental issues are dealt with in Europe. Uh, this presents at this point one of the more uh, difficult problems for some of the new governments because they are, as uh, uh, our speaker, as one of our speakers this morning pointed out, they are, as Dr. Cusin pointed out, they are not only citizens of their own countries, but they are citizens of Europe with a legal structure. So that the Council of Europe has a variety of environmental regulations and mandates and protocols. The European Commission does, the European Parliament does, and this offers both, both hope and, com and presents uh, uh, an enormous range of initial problems in trying to determine how one weaves into this process. And at this point, only Hungary is a full member of the Council of Europe. Many of the other Central and Eastern European countries wish to become so, but are uh, presently simply in, have observer status. And one cannot discuss environmental issues within, in Europe without recognizing, if you will, the federalist legal component in it. You, there are European dimensions. There are national dimensions. I could add a lot to that because it's an issue that our center has worked on and with, with parliamentarians and government officials and private leaders in Europe and here, but I will not. I will try to restrain myself as a, as a genuine model for my colleagues here. So uh, I would like to begin by asking Professor Valentin uh, Kadosonov from the Russian Institute for Political and Social Studies, advisor to the Council of Ministers, to share his thoughts with us. Professor Kadosonov. Uh, thank you. I'm very obliged to uh, to the Federalist Organization uh, for the chance given me to take this floor. Uh, two preliminary notes. The first preliminary note is about my language. I may speak a little bit, uh, but I don't get understand everything. Uh, so if somebody asks uh, questions me, uh, uh, speak slowly, or, I u or otherwise I use my interpreter. And secondly, um, I'm not a lawyer. And I think uh, the topic uh, is a little bit, my topic is a little bit different from that what uh, we were speaking about uh, previously. Um, I have very short time, so uh, some thoughts, uh, some items. First of all, I want uh, to underline uh, the fact that ecological problems in uh, Soviet Union today are of high priority, of very high priority. I was very um, surprised uh, when uh, I learned about uh, the results of one uh, uh, public opinion poll that was held a month ago in the Soviet Union. 
and it turned out uh, that uh, uh, the first uh, priority, the top priority problem was environmental protection. It was even higher by priority than, uh, for example, shortages of food. Can you imagine? That was a real surprise for me. That was a real surprise. That is why I think everybody, politician, lawyer, economist, should take into consideration ecological aspects, ecological aspects of decision-making of every project, including, for example, joint ventures uh, with uh, American companies. I think uh, they should be taken into consideration when you are going uh, to develop economic relations uh, with the Soviet Union and uh, republics uh, that compose our um, uh, Soviet Union. And uh, uh, I was rather surprised uh, when I um, read uh, learning from the United States mistakes. I don't know where, whether there are mistakes. I think uh, there are maybe contradictions of uh, ecological and economic development. Uh, maybe shortages of knowledge about uh, very sophisticated uh, interactions between economy, society, and nature and environment. And uh, I think uh, nobody could, fo uh, could forecast uh, these contradictions when uh, 20 years ago you started your environmental programs. And certainly uh, we should uh, learn not from your mistakes, we should uh, study your experience. And I think uh, uh, we should take into consideration uh, your experience both in uh, <coughs> legislature and uh, your experience uh, in um, introducing economic methods of managing environment. And I think that was quite natural that uh, first you began uh, regulating environment uh, with uh, administrative and uh, legislative instruments. That was quite natural. Uh, but when you have set up an infrastructure, legislative infrastructure for nature protection, then you could uh, uh, proceed to the second stage, to the stage of bringing, introducing economic incentives and economic instruments. I'm very careful, I'm very careful about uh, immediate introduction of economic methods uh, into the field of nature pr uh, protection in our country. Um, we should be very careful. We have no legislative infrastructure in our country. Uh, it is similar for nature protection, uh, for human rights, uh, for other economic and social problems. That is why uh, we shouldn't uh, be very impatient. Uh, uh, a small philosophical uh, um, uh, contemplation. Um, uh, five, ten years ago I was uh, in a position uh, to that uh, regime and I felt myself like a dissident, and I was voting for reforms. I was fighting for reforms, and I had some troubles in my life. Now, uh, I'm, it may uh, be rather strange, I am also in a position. I am also in a position, uh, but if previously I felt myself radical um, dissident, now I feel myself conservative dissident. <laughs> Uh, because I think we shouldn't be very impatient. We shouldn't be very impatient about uh, um, having everything tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Uh, some philosophical uh, contemplation, another one. Um, uh, Marxism, Leninism. Uh, I myself was to teach uh, uh, students <laughs> Marxism, Leninism, uh, to deliver lectures. Uh, and I know very well that uh, the nuclei of this theory is the idea of revolution, social revolution. That is uh, the idea of social impatience. And I think uh, we may repeat uh, the, say, uh, the same mistake uh, as we had uh, more than 70 years ago. Uh, I take, for example, 500 days uh, of transition to market. I think uh, it's idealistic and maybe it's very serious for democracy for everything in our society, because it is a rather technocratic approach to our society. And it would be technocratic um, um, 
as applied to any other society. Uh, we should take into consideration ecological aspects. We should take into, consider, uh, into consideration psychological consequences, uh, social consequences, and so on and so forth. And, uh, for example, uh, if we begin uh, to make revolution in 500 days, then certainly uh, our people uh, would have uh, such severe so uh, sh uh, shortages of food uh, that, uh, for example, ecological problems would not be priority. And uh, we would devastate our nature in 500 days. That is my idea. Because uh, nobody made an expertise, ecological expertise of that program. I think we should be more careful, more civilized, more civilized, uh, more professional, as my colleague told. We are not professionals, so we should be professionals. And uh, I'm not going uh, into details, uh, because after all it's not ecological <laughs> conference and meeting, uh, but I'd like to underline that we need uh, ecological cooperation uh, with Western countries, including the United States of America. There are many common points. First of all, I noted about uh, joint ventures. Uh, we should um, both uh, uh, make some consensus about ecological aspects, ecological limitations uh, for joint venturing in the Soviet Union. Uh, we are not against uh, foreign capital on the one hand. On the other hand, we don't want uh, to have uh, our country uh, ecological colony. So we should look for consensus. This is a very, very um, del delicate process. And uh, uh, several years ago, uh, several day days ago, we uh, made an agreement with one American organization, Oligus International, to set up special uh, permanent committee for Eastern Europe and for the USSR uh, to set up dialogue between groups of interests, uh, private companies, government, green movements, and uh, science and academician circles. I think that is a good idea. That is an example how we are learning to become civilized. Then, um, uh, we are declaring uh, great ecological goals. Uh, we are even appropriating, my, uh, we are even uh, giving money uh, to prevent pollution and uh, to conserve nature. But we have no equipment, no ecological equipment. And uh, that is a great potential market for American and Western companies. Um, and I think uh, we shall have money for this uh, vital um, aspect of our life. Uh, maybe we shall not buy anything else, but we should buy environmental equipment. And uh, there are many other aspects. I don't uh, want uh, to be very long, uh, because otherwise uh, the effect of my speech uh, would uh, be lower. So thank you for your patience, <laughs> for your attention. I'm looking for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Kartosanov. Uh, a story about gear before turning to our next speaker. When President Havel was in Washington to speak to Congress, uh, he was chatting with some of our environmentalist leaders in the Congress, and one said, we should have a conference in, in Prague and bring together all the environmental ministers and all the legislative environmental people and all the other people to talk about what should be done. And President Havel looked at them very strangely. A person happens to be a friend of mine that he looked at very strangely and pulled out of his pocket a letter, a, a letter and said, well, he said, I don't want any conferences. We've had enough conferences. But if you know anybody who wants to provide us with the, air me the pollution measuring equipment in the air in Czechoslovakia, here are the specifications. And he walked on. Uh, it, uh, I, I don't disagree with the need for dialogue, but I think your other point about the need for equipment, for, for uh, concrete assistance of that kind to, to fathom the dimension of the problems is a critical one. Our next speaker is actually, I've been told, responsible for the subtitle, so I'm going to ask him at some point in his remarks to explain the subtitle. Uh, Professor E. Donald Elliott, uh, the General Counsel of the Environmental Protection Agency and uh, uh, teach, teacher at uh, uh, Yale Law School uh, in this area, is a person who has been very much in the middle of many of the efforts to create 
uh, serious regional responses uh, toward the environment uh, within Central and Eastern Europe, and I'm looking forward to his remarks. Professor Elliott. Thank you very much. Uh, I had several really good jokes, but I've had to cut them out in the interest of time. Uh, let me let me mention, however. You have another minute. <laughs> uh, let me mention, however, that uh, I was very uh, interested in the uh, point that uh, many people in the in the uh, Eastern Europe regard a healthy environment as even more important than uh, food shortages. There was a recent Roper poll in the United States that indicated that people in the United States regard a, a, a healthy environment as more important than a healthy sex life. So that may uh, give you some indication of the similarities. Um, I think there are uh, a number of important uh, points of uh, comparison. Certainly, the situation in Eastern Europe, which is, uh, is probably one of the most polluted uh, areas in the world, uh, indicates that the uh, perceived contradiction between economic development and environmental protection uh, is probably a, a misperception. Uh, it's, a, it's an old uh, point, I think, first made in the United States, really, by, by Gifford Pinchot, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Secretary of the Interior, that uh, in the long run, economic progress and protection and conservation of the natural world need to go hand in hand. And I think increasingly that perspective uh, is becoming a worldwide consensus under the notion of uh, developing the techniques of sustainable development. So I think that's one of the lessons that we can learn from the experience in Eastern Europe. Turning though to the, uh, to the topic of this, uh, uh, this panel, um, which is what the uh, Eastern Europeans can, can learn from us, from our, from our mistakes. Um, I think that um, I would go back to what Professor Epstein said uh, the other day, uh, do, as we, do as we say, not as we do. I think in the environmental area, one would need to modify that a little bit. It would probably be, uh, my advice would be to do as we are beginning to do, not as we have, uh, not as we have done. This is, I think, a, a common phenomenon of really trying to leapfrog the technology, not to not necessarily go through all the same steps that we have done, but to, but to essentially go to the next step. And the next step, I think, in environmental protection uh, is really to go to much more property-based and market-based uh, uh, approaches. Um, Fred Smith is really one of the leaders in this, uh, in this area in terms of the book he wrote in 1973 with Bruce Ackerman called The Uncertain Search for Environmental Quality, which at, at the time was very revolutionary in recommending that we get away from command and control systems to more market-based systems. But that's going on to really become a virtual uh, academic consensus as to what we ought to be doing. Their, their book was um, uh, awarded the, uh, an award by that bastion of conservatism, the Harvard Law School, uh, as the best book uh, in, uh, in the uh, administrative law area of the, uh, of the decade. So I think the stage that we're really uh, at today is no longer debating what we ought to do, but trying to turn some of those academic theories into, uh, into practical, uh, practical realities. The program that we've had to date, I think, has been a, a qualified success or a qualified failure, depending on your uh, perspective. Uh, we have made measurable progress in cleaning up virtually every area of the environment that we have attempted. On the other hand, our program has been incredibly costly. Um, EPA is currently pulled together, and it's also interesting that this is the first time anybody has ever pulled these figures together, but we have recently pulled together figures indicating that uh, we spend about $90 billion annually on environmental protection in the U.S. By the year 2000, that's going to go up to $155 billion, or about 2.7 percent of our total GNP. So as you can see, this is really a very major um, undertaking. On the other hand, Unfortunately, our priorities in this area are quite spotty, if not irrational. We certainly don't uh, tailor very well today the level of effort and the level of cost to where the risks are greatest. And that really leads me to the three recommendations that I would make based on our experience. First is to set clear, measurable priorities for what you're doing, preferably on the basis of where your efforts can do the most to reduce risks. Secondly, one ought to try to use market and property-based systems as opposed to administrative systems wherever possible. And thirdly, one should be very, very careful not to stifle innovation uh, by mandating particular technologies on a short-term time horizon. 
In the uh, short-term time horizon uh, remaining, I'll try and elaborate a little bit on those uh, three recommendations. Um, recently, Bill Riley gave a speech with a very revealing title called Aiming Before We Shoot. And the criticism was that in the past, our efforts in environmental protection had been very reactive and not really informed by, uh, by a, a, a set of uh, uh, clear priorities. We, we tended to have a very political process, which some people used to refer to as the chemical of the month club, uh, in which our priorities would be set by press reports and react to uh, public concerns rather than in terms of any uh, a clearly thought out uh, approach. In the, in the next uh, generation, I think, we're going to be trying much more to try to have a set of priorities that is much more, uh, much more risk-based. And I think it's also important to have uh, measurable um, goals uh, in which somebody's performance can be assessed. Um, somebody asked me a, a question at a, um, at a conference the other day about whether or didn't I think that we ought to wait until we see whether or not the acid rain trading program works before we use more market-based approaches. And I said, no, I, I've always felt that we ought to judge market-based approaches and command and control approaches by the same standard. And we've never expected command and control approaches to uh, work before we, uh, before we enact more of them. So I don't see why we ought to have a, a and in fact, we've had sort of the opposite approach. I, I call it the when prophecy fails syndrome. There's a wonderful book about millenarian movements that predict the end of the world. And then when the world doesn't end, uh, they find that as an excuse why the prophecy was really right. We've had something of the same approach in the environmental area. We enact a statute, it doesn't achieve its goals, that becomes a justification for enacting more of the same. Uh, and I think that what you really need to do is to set very clear uh, priorities. How much more time do I have? You're out. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you for your patience, Professor. Thank you for your patience, Professor Elliott. I, I will let all of you judge whether that's really Professor Elliott or not, because this picture has a mustache and he doesn't at this point, but I assume it is, and uh, not having met him before. And our next, our next speaker, uh, in the time remaining, uh, who will be using up that time, obviously, is Fred Smith. And Fred, as you all know, is the founder and president of the Competitive Inst Enterprise Institute and a number of other organizations, and has been at the forefront of uh, trying to develop a more rational approach to environmental issues in this country, and it's a pleasure to introduce him. Fred, the floor is yours. Trying is the operative word. Failing would be more appropriate, I'm afraid. The theme that environmental policy, learning from America's mistakes, uh, it's an important one. There's a lot to learn from America. From the creation of EPA, America has been an organization, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has been an organization of first class lawyers and second class scientists and economists. There's been far more concern over the enforceability of the Clean Air Act than there has been the attainment of clean air. Environmental policy in the United States is political policy, and there are many reasons why that standard is not exportable to the, to the or not likely to be exported to the countries of Eastern and Central Europe. As, as we were just heard, you're talking about expending hundreds of billions of dollars relatively wastefully. Your countries don't have that much money. You're talking about armies of lawyers suing everyone in sight. Uh, with science and economics taking very much a back seat. One of my friends at EPA says, we believe in good science, we believe in good economics, we're just not allowed to practice it. Um, do you really want those rules in your country to prevail? Politics encourages those rules. There's great reliance on a very large, and generally in America, honest bureaucracy. Does one want to tempt the same bureaucracy responsible for any of your problems with a vast new array of imaginative powers? As we mentioned, we are chasing the sensational headlines of the day rather than any serious environmental policies. Every look at EPA has found it misprioritizes dramatically, and those criticisms are coming from the left as well as the right and the business community. There's no role for the individual in the current environmental policy in the United States. The only role for the individual in environmental policy is to lobby Congress to grant more powers and resources to the to the central state, to the Environmental Protection Agency. Is that really a model for the European economies? And finally, there's a massive suspicion that is generated in the current system about the problems of economic growth and, and technological change. Leningrad today instituted bread rationing for the first time since World War II when it was being blockaded. Is it really clear that we want to add a new line of ecological blockaders to the future economic growth of your country. Do your, na your nations need more political controls? This is a terribly brief sketch of a very complex issue 
and we believe that politics is not the solution, that free markets offer opportunities. I'm from Washington, where everyone believes that practical policies require that things fit on a, bu on a bumper sticker of an automobile, and it looks like that's what we're doing here today. We've got some publications that a lot elaborate on this in, in more detail if you're interested to come up afterwards. The problem today is that most in Americans, and I mean conservatives as well as liberals, believe have the same paradigm to explain environmental issues. Environmental problems occur because markets have failed. Everyone believes that. Markets are good, rational institutions. But markets, of course, leave out certain things. Pollution are external to the market. Since they're outside, markets fail to address those, and thus government has to intervene. So for those parts of the economy that have environmental implications, we will have to have political control of the economy. But as Paul Harvey says, Page two, every economic decision has environmental consequences, so EPA is led to be the economic czar, the central ecological planner of our total economy. We understand that that is not a feasible outcome. For the same reasons that political institutions have failed to protect the, to, to manage the economy, they cannot possibly do the far more complex task of managing the ecology. We find ourselves falling into what F Frederick Hayek talks about. We're now going down the same road to serfdom. We're paving it with green bricks rather than red bricks, but it leads to the same dreary totalitarian end state. KGB uniforms are far as green. Do we really want EPA officials to take those uniforms and put them on? I think not. There's a lot of arguments that can be made as to why markets fail, the market failure paradigm doesn't work. Let me just give you one quickly. If that were true, then of course non-market economies would have less environmental problems. Well, I think we don't need to argue that point in this audience. As the Iron Curtain has opened up, not only have we seen economic and civil liberty problems, we've seen ecological disasters that approximate the worst dreams of the ecology movement in the United States. Market economies, capitalism as a first approximation has been the first line of defense for ecological values. The freest economies in the world have the healthiest ecologies. The most controlled economies in the world have the worst ecologies. And that's not accidental. Capitalism targets efficiency incentives. It encourages people to think carefully before they use energy, before they use materials. And efficient use of energy and materials places less stress on the environment and therefore makes it possible to have a cleaner environment. Therefore, I disagree with Valentin. The first first step in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe is not to worry about creating some new EPA, it's to capitalize their economies. The first step is to privatize the economy and to put in place the incentives that reduce the stress on the economy and produce the wealth that makes it possible to do better in other areas. How much time do I have? Uh, A little bit more? Okay. Uh, three more minutes. Okay. The, the problem in America is not that we have, where markets have existed in our economy, we have found it possible to protect both economic and ecological values. The problem is not that markets have failed, but we have been singularly unimaginative about expanding markets to cover a broader array of the environmental resources at risk. American law is riddled with examples where government, not private parties, own resources. One third of America. We have regulatory taking rules profounding daily, which weaken the ability of private owners to protect their own properties, and we have an array of antitrust rules which make it hard for individuals to cooperate in conserving natural resources in other areas. In effect, the nations of Eastern Europe and the, and once accepted a fallacious idea of, from the West about how to organize society. Marx believed that capitalism, private property, had been a good idea in its day, but now it had to give way. That chaos, that inefficiency, would have to give way to the scientific means of organizing the good economy. There was a tension between economic freedom and economic efficiency, and we had to pick nostalgia or the future. We know that Marx was wrong. Capitalism, private property, were not antagonistic to economic growth. They were essential to it. Only those institutions made it possible to mobilize the energies and enthusiasms of the peoples of the world to produce those results. We're now being told something similar. Capitalism, private property are antagonistic to the vi vision of an ecological quality world. Once again, we must choose between the outmoded processes of private property and a future ecological world, if we want to save spaceship Earth. That tension, I would argue, is also imaginary. There is no tension there. Only a system of expanding property, property, pro private property offers any opportunity, any hope 
of protecting something as rich, as complex as the ecology of spaceship Earth. Your economies now are molten. You're going through a dramatic process of reforming yourselves. Take that opportunity. You must privatize your economy. Move beyond the United States and privatize your ecologies also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. I'm going to uh, give Professor Elliott and Professor Katasonov half a minute or a minute if you want to say one thing in response to uh, what you just uh, heard, after which we're going to have to conclude. So uh, let's start with you, Professor Katasonov. Uh, well, I'm not going uh, to start a discussion uh, with uh, Professor Smith. Uh, it seems to me that he is teasing me. <laughs> um, uh, I think that, after all, um, uh, privatization of uh, nature and nature protection uh, is a little bit idealistic. We yesterday spoke about it. Uh, Professor Smith uh, uh, thinks uh, that uh, uh, such a society may exist uh, that uh, needs no state and no government. That was, after all, your ultimate position, yes? <laughs> a goal, an ideal goal to move towards. Yes. yes, I think it's idealistic. It's a little bit like anarchism, I would say. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, we shall dis uh, we shall continue our discussion uh, privately. We shall not involve people in our <laughs> private discussion. Thank you, Professor Elliot. Well, I I uh, have a good deal of agreement with uh, the substance, if not the tone of. Uh, Fred Smith's remarks. Uh, I think that, uh, if anything, uh, the, the green peril that he portrays strikes me as being uh, remarkably antiquated. I haven't heard anyone use the term spaceship Earth in about 20 years, Fred, and I, I really, uh, it was nice to hear it again. Uh, I think this notion that we ought to be expanding uh, command and control approaches uh, is a stage that the environmental movement in the United States went through, but I think it's really far past that. There is, I think, a, a very valuable analogy between some of the mistakes we've made and some of the mistakes that were made in the Soviet Union. In fact, uh, my, my colleague, uh, 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 the Assistant Attorney General uh, for the uh, Environment Division of the Department of Justice, Dick Stewart, uh, in an article written <coughs> about five years ago, referred to the U.S. approach to environmental protection as an example of the, the failed method of Soviet-style central planning. And I think what we're doing is very much trying to move away from a central planning approach to adopt a much more property-based approach. The role of the government in this area is largely to try to define property rights in a way that they can be traded in a market where it's possible to do that. And the 1990 Clean Air Act is the first major step to try that in a big way in terms of the acid rain trading program, where although it is not property for takings purposes, as a practical matter, what the government does and what EPA's role is in that system is to define a series of tradable allowances which can be traded in a market so that we, rather than having the government specifying the pollution levels for each individual source, one uses the market to try to get an optimal uh, allocation. <coughs> this is a, uh, an, uh, an idea whose time has come. It's been extensively studied. Uh, there is a real consensus that it's the way that we ought to go. It's very much the type of approach that I would, and in previous conferences, have urged that the Soviet Union consider uh, very carefully, because I think our, exper our experience, uh, in a way, with environmental protection over the last 20 years is really very similar to the, uh, to the planned economy experience in the Soviet Union. And we are increasingly moving back toward a decentralized, market-based approach where the technologies are available to define those, uh, those types of property rights, which is, not, uh, which is not everywhere. It's a complex discussion. Unfortunately, Alan, it can't be reduced to 30 seconds, but uh, anybody who wants to talk well. about it in more detail, I'll be glad <coughs> to do that. And there's a, there's a very good literature about it. There's an excellent symposium article in 1987 in the Columbia Journal of Environmental Law, uh, which really collects a lot of fine articles about these types of approaches. Well, thank you. I, as we close, I want to first thank our three panelists. They, they've been extremely brave in, in trying to get all of these ideas out in a very short period of time, and it really was not fair to any of the three as we've compressed it, as it has somehow become compressed. But can I have a hand for all three of them? <laughs>